Hello everybody, Chuck Northside Guy back with another video featuring three more Hall of Famers appearing in the 1933 Gaudi set. Rabbit Moranville is our first uh, player. He played 23 seasons in the National League, uh, a mark that hasn't been broken until, that wasn't broken until 1986 uh, by Pete Rose. Um, the card you see here I just think is emblematic of the 1933 Gaudi series and reflects just why I love this series uh, and why I'm just obsessively making video after video featuring different cards of this series. I love that red big league chewing gum at the bottom. I like the, the almost photographic features of the players themselves on the card, even though it's obviously a a drawing and a painting almost. When you see these cards in person, they very much feel and look like antiques, but very well preserved antiques in the case of a, a PSA 5 version or example of these cards. And I just love this card. And I'm going to give you the usual rundown of who Rabbit Moranville is, but I just uh, I realize I don't talk enough about my just love of the cards themselves. And I know every collector, uh, you know, feels a passion for whatever it is that they really focus on in their collection. We see folks collecting all types uh, in, in various videos. Um, for me, 1933 Gaudi is, is what I'm working on right now. I'm working on the 1953 Bowman. Uh, I'm not going to film any three thing on the 1953 Bowman. I'm going to leave that to Bowman 53. He's doing an outstanding job and getting really close to completing that set. And I'm rooting him on, as I'm sure others who are following his uh, wonderful videos. But uh, I, I just want uh, folks to know I just really love these cards and hope that uh, by posting them uh, and really dialing in on them bit by bit, that folks who also love the Gaudi are getting something out of it and an appreciation. <clears throat> I think the PSA 5s are um, a wonderful way to see them. Um, certainly there are better examples. There are auctions by Heritage from time to time that are PSA 8, and they're extraordinary, also really expensive. <clears throat> These aren't cheap, but uh, uh, I just think this is a wonderful example of uh, why I love the 1933 Gaudis. All right, well, <clears throat> enough about me. Uh, the cards uh, themselves, let me flip it around as I give you some facts on Rabbit Moranville. This was towards uh, the end of his career. He finished uh, third in the MVP voting in his first full season playing for the Boston Braves as a 21-year-old in 1913, so 20 years prior to this season shown here. And can you believe it? He finished third in that MVP, hitting just three, 247, 247 with two home runs. I don't get it. The following year, he was a runner-up in the MVP voting to Johnny Evers when the Braves won the National League pennant and then swept the Philadelphia A's in the World Series. That year, Moranville was the Braves' cleanup hitter, despite again hitting just a paltry 246 and hitting four home runs. Now, that was the dead ball era. So even at age 41, when Moranville batted 218 and had no homers, he finished in a tie for 12th in the MVP voting. So I don't get it, guys. Um, Moranville was known as one of baseball's most famous clowns due to his practical jokes and lack of in inhibitions. Later, when he was a, a player coach for the Cubs, he uh, was found uh, outside of Ebbets Field in Brooklyn mimicking a newsboy hawking newspaper. He cried out, read all about it. Moranville fired. And so he was the next day. Uh, Moranville was inducted somehow, I don't get it, uh, into the Hall of Fame uh, in 1954, along with Bill Terry and Bill Dickey. So beautiful card, not sh uh, Hall of Famer, not sure why he's in the Hall of Fame, but Rabbit Moranville. A lot of fun stories in this set, aren't there? Um, next up is Earl Combs. Earl Combs batted leadoff and played center field on the Yankees' uh, fabled 1927 team, often referred to as Murderer's Row. He's one of six players on that team to have been inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. The other five were Waite Hoyt, Herb Pennick, 
Tony Lazari, Lou Gehrig, and Babe Ruth. Uh, he was nicknamed the Kentucky Colonel, and he was known as a gentleman uh, on and off the field. He played from 1924 to 1935, lifetime batting average, not 325. Um, he led the league in triples three different times. In his best year, which happened to be 1927, that famous illustrious season with the Yankees, he hit 356. He had 231 hits, 36 doubles, and 23 tipples. Triples. Tipples. What am I thinking? Triples. Um, Combs also suffered a very um, serious accident one year after the 1933 season. In 1934, on 100 degree day in St. Louis. He crashed into the outfield wall going after a fly ball. He fractured his skull, broke his shoulder, and damaged his knee. And he was reportedly near death for several days and was hospitalized for another two months. He attempted a, a comeback after that injury, but he uh, ended up losing his job to uh, an up-and-coming rookie center fielder by the name of Joe DiMaggio. So Combs retired at the age of 36. Now, I'm going to set up a contrast here. Let me, let, me, let me set it up for you guys. I'm going to read you four different quotes. Miller Huggins said that if you had nine combs on your ball club, you could go to bed every night and sleep like a baby. Joe McCarthy, another longtime Yankees manager, said they wouldn't pay baseball managers much of a salary if they all presented a few problems, as few problems as did Earl Combs, Babe Ruth. Combs was more than a good ball player. He was always a first-class gentleman. And sports writers said, if a vote were taken of the sports writers as to who their favorite ball player of the Yankees would be, Combs would have been their choice. All right, so we have those kind of quotes. Sounds like PR quotes to me. Combs was uh, selected for induction in the Hall of Fame in 1970 by the Veterans Committee. When he learned of the honor, he said, I thought the Hall of Fame was for superstars, not for average players like me. Saber matrician. Bill James has listed Combs as one of 10 examples of Hall of Fame inductees who do not deserve the honor. Interesting story, beautiful card, Earl Combs. We're going to finish this video with Chuck Klein. Let me make a shout out to Ray from Philly and Mike O, who are Phillies fans. Chuck Klein in uh, 1933 was a, a Philadelphia Philly. Phillies in later years retired his jersey. He was kind of the pre-number era, so he's retired simply with a P for him, as my understanding, out there by the Phillies. Lifetime batting average for Chuck Klein, 320. Known as the Hoosier Hammer. Hammer came from Philadelphia. And in 1933, he won the Triple Crown. So that's the season you see depicted here. He won the Triple Crown this year, Chuck Klein. Batting average, 368, 28 home runs, 120 RBIs. And in spite of winning the Triple Crown, he didn't win the MVP. Carl Hubble won the MVP. You'll have to look at another of my videos uh, in this series. You'll see the two cards that Carl Hubble appears on in the 1933 Gaudi. He also became the first Phillies player to ever bat in an All-Star game in 1933. But his best season, in fact, came uh, in 1930. In 1930, he hit 386, 250 hits, 158 runs scored. And he also has some other Phillies records that are still standing with 59 doubles, 170 RBIs in a season, a 680 C. 687 slugging percentage and 445 total bases. No other player has had that many total bases in a season since. Um, his 107 extra base hits that year, 1930, are a National Re League record, and it was tied by Barry Bonds in 2001. Uh, after, uh, after retiring, uh, Klein... Um, ran a bar in Philadelphia, and he endured some financial, difficult financial problems due to a, a drinking problem. He was inducted by the Veterans Committee into the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame in 1980. Chuck Klein, 
Beautiful example, Triple Crown winner, 1933. We'll take a peek at the back. You can zoom in on that if you want, gentlemen. Chuck Klein, beautiful card, great season, classic set. Hope you enjoyed. More to come.